All right, welcome. Um, so some of you have probably noticed that we've been doing these uh, wolf experiments. Um, and we wanted to take some time to share some of our initial findings with you. Um, we don't exactly know where this is going yet, but we're, from what we've seen so far, it seems quite clear that when people do work out how to work in a single code space, in some method, whether it's Wolfpack or not, it's going to fundamentally change the way we're developing code. We've seen some pretty interesting stuff so far. Um, so wolves are our focus. Um, and so we want to start by just doing a very quick introduction to how, uh, how a wolf pack hunts and how they operate, because that's kind of our metaphor. Um, so a wolf pack is, tends to be a family unit. Uh, they tend to be normally sort of groups of 6 to 12. They might be as much as 25. And the alpha wolves will be, in most cases, the, the mo mother and the father of this pack. Um, so there may be cases where that changes, but that's going to be the general rule. Uh, wolf packs roam a territory. They have a territory that they, they defend, um, and they, they own it basically by walking it. So they'll travel this space, sort of you know, looping around, covering all the territory every few weeks. Um, and on a regular basis, obviously, they need to eat. And so what they're doing as they're roaming around is they're looking for a herd that they're going to target. Um, and when they found that herd, what they want to do is figure out which animal they're going to hunt. And wolves, are they're pack animals. They work together in the hunt. But at this point, they're going to test the animals individually. So different, different wolves will chase different animals, and they'll figure out you know, which animal seems like it's slow, or it's weak, or it's young, or it's unhealthy. And they'll take that, that animal. And then once they've selected that as the prey animal, the wolves together are going to work all uh, targeting the same animal. Um, so once they've selected that one, they're all going to chase all together. And the prey basically is going to do one of two things. Either it's going to run, or it's going to stand its ground. Um, and if the animal runs, the whole pack will chase. And they may chase for quite a long period of time. It could be hours. Sometimes they may even follow a prey over a day. Um, but if it stands, um, then they take a different approach. And the wolves will circle this animal to sort of contain it. And um, two wolves at a time will sort of worry the, worry the prey, and the others will rest. And the idea is to really wear down the animal. So as the wolves tire, they'll lie down and rest, and two other wolves will um, take over. So this is sort of the metaphor that we've chosen to experiment with. Um, so in our metaphor, um, instead of roaming territory, these groups of programmers who are also going to be you know, we've played with six, eight, maybe ten. We're thinking that kind of size. Um, and the, the territory represents the problem domain or the code base that we're working in. And so you have these packs roaming within this space. Uh, the equivalent of searching for a herd to, to eat is uh, searching for a requirement or a feature that they're going to implement. So this is going to be based on user requirements. It might be which one is the closest to what we're doing, which one looks like an easy target. Um, you know, there's a number of criteria for that, but what, what is the thing that we're going to implement next? Um, we think that's like testing spikes. So each of the wolves in this part of the process um, go off on their own, and maybe not on their own, it might be in one, twos, or threes, but they're going off and they're going to try to do a spike and sort of figure out, is this a good solution, right? Um, each, so I should have said, each prey animal within the herd is representing a possible implementation to the, the problem that you've decided to target. So you want to find which is the easiest one, which is the one that's going to get us there with the least amount of effort. And once the wolves have individually gone off and sort of figured this out, then they come back together and um, they decide, okay, well, which one, which one seems like the easiest? Which one are we going for? And then similarly, they have a decision. And they think, well, um, does it look like we have a handle on the problem? Or does it not look like, a handle, or like we have a handle on the problem? And if, if we do, um, sorry, I'm one behind there. If we, um, if we think we're close to the solution, then we're all going to pile into it. And this is one of the really crazy parts about the wolf pack that we've been, we don't even know if it works, but it, it seems to sort of work, that we actually get everyone actively coding, trying to solve it at once. Uh, when you start to feel, or if you start to feel like the problem is getting away from you, then you, you do the same thing. You, you rest, and we take two programmers at a time. Um, so two will be coding on the solution as quickly as they can, trying to make as much progress as they can in a short period of time. And if they 
stop making progress, the alphas are going to sort of swap them out for two other wolves. Um, so while those two are rest or while those two are programming, the others are going to be sitting, thinking, they might be writing unit tests, they might be thinking about how they're going to solve the problem when it's their turn. And the key is to kind of you know, flip as quickly as possible back and forth to move the solution forward as quickly as possible. Okay, so uh, this is a diagram drawn by Kent Beck about the primary practices of XP. And uh, Kent says that uh, XP is the best practices taken to the logical extremes. And uh, we've come to the conclusion that maybe he was wrong and that he was just too timid. And that some of the things that we've uncovered in this process are um, just that much more extreme. In fact, to use the spinal tap metaphor, we've turned it, the volume up to 11 in uh, a number of areas. And so we're going to talk about some of those. Okay, so the first one is uh, virtual reality. Okay, so what we've come to realize is that when you put a whole lot of people in a space, it is, that space is like living in a virtual reality. And uh, that virtual reality, uh, people have done before coding spaces in virtual reality, but you tend to have something that looks a bit like this, but actually uh, the virtual reality that you are dealing with is more like this, okay? The code is actually your reality. You don't need any other uh, metaphor to express your virtual reality. You walk around, you exist, you share the space of the virtual reality that is your code. Okay, next one. So, pairing is really a shared view. It's, it's, it's a restrictive process in a lot of ways because you're sharing one, one display. And so if you take the analogy of a virtu virtual world, it's like having a single avatar that two people are sharing. So we've really taken that beyond the idea of pair programming and what we're saying is n-way programming. You can have as many people as you want because you're no longer limited by this physical sharing of space. So if you want to have four people looking at a method or eight people looking at a method or whatever, you can do that. Um, and the beauty of that is that you can really change modes. You can have two people writing, several people reading, some people are flipping off and looking at documentation, other people are doing a little spike, and you can flip between those modes very fluidly because you're not swapping keyboards and moving chairs. You have your own display and you just, you know, you just swap and you go and do what you want to do. Um, one thing that we've observed is that we'd really like a way, which isn't in there right now, to be able to follow somebody's path so that, you know, much like pairing, you can say at the moment if, if somebody is typing in a method in web velocity and you're looking at the same method, you can see them typing, but if they go off to another method, you don't know where they've gone. So it would be really nice to have a way where you could just sort of click on a person and suddenly you'd now be actually following their view, so it would be similar to sitting next to them and having that sort of following experience. Um, uh, yeah, okay. Um, tripling seem to be very common, um, much more common than pairing. Uh, people, although even in the spikes we encourage people to do their own spikes, what seems to happen is that people actually group into sometimes twos, sometimes threes, sometimes they're alone. But the group of three sitting together seems to be a very common pattern. And they seem to swap between often having either one person coding and two people doing sort of domain research, looking at the APIs, that kind of thing. Um, or having one person coding and, sorry, is that what I said? One, one and two or two and one, anyway, they flip back and forth. Um, groups of four and more seem to be much less common, um, and I think that's largely a limitation of the physical space. Um, you, you know, you have a few people sitting on either side of you and it's very easy to communicate that way. We do have cases where you're communicating across the whole table, but, um, you know, to have individual conversations with people who are sort of spread all over the place is, is much more difficult. Okay, so you now have a common space that you are living in and you have aspects of communal living. You have to share that space. You have to be a well-behaved citizen in that space and that leads to some changes in behavior. Uh, change within that space needs to be a little bit more gradual. You, uh, you're likely to find very frustrated other walls if you go, ha ha, I've got this brilliant idea. I'm just going to completely change this class hierarchy. I'm going to do a massive refactoring break the whole thing for a couple of days, that kind of behavior you just don't get away with. 
So uh, you've got to be more considerate. You've got to do more gradual change. You've got to communicate what you're doing. You've got to say, okay, I'm thinking about uh, refactoring in this way. Anyone got any problems? Right, okay, I'm going ahead. And, you know, don't, don't be surprised if something's not working for a few minutes or an hour or something. And you've got to be uh, cleaner, right? You are, it's like living in a, uh, I don't know, a student kitchen, right? I mean, the student houses I lived in, the kitchen was a bombsite and remained a bombsite for most of the year. And um, you can't get away with that kind of lifestyle in this e environment. If you leave debris, code that doesn't work and so on, uh, it has an immediate impact on your fellow inhabitants. And so you've got to clean up uh, much more immediately. Okay, so uh, we've, something, we've come to realize as part of this that uh, there is something different about continuous integration. <sighs> well, simply put, it just isn't continuous integration. Um, the kind of analogy that we use is, it seems to us it, that continuous integration is a bit like the um, edit, compile, run loop of 3GL languages in the 1990s, that uh, you go through a similar kind of loop trying to get things integrated, and uh, what you do living in a common space, a common code space, is you don't go through that loop. Your integration uh, is happening at a uh, method by method uh, existence, right? So just like small talk, you compile on a method by method basis, or um, in Web Velocity, you even compile on a uh, gosh, that thing will compile, so it's compiled, um, which seems even more extreme. Okay, um, that integration is, it puts challenges on the people living in that space. The fact that you, uh, as soon as you change a method, you are affecting everybody else, uh, potentially. And so you have to be a bit more thoughtful about how you go about changing things. Uh, changing more fundamental things has a, m uh, a bigger impact. Uh, breaking something also has an impact, and we suspect that uh, if teams got more used to this, they would, they would find mechanisms maybe of uh, evolving change more effectively. And so they would code in a slightly different way. And it's not to say that this is easy or wonderful. It is probably uh, quite hard. And certainly we've seen the wolf packs that we've observed struggle with this process. In fact, one of the common requests is, uh, please tell me how I'm meant to do this, because this is hard and it doesn't seem to be working for us. Your process is horrible. But um, to which the nice and polite reply is, no, no, that's part of the experiment. We're trying to find out how people do this and whether it, is, whether it works, whether it's a, uh, a people can come up with uh, models for making it work. Yeah, and partly people have been, um, people come up with their own solutions like subclassing or putting name prefixes on methods. And all of that is really a temporary uh, solution as a way of seeing, well, what kind of first class support would we want for that sort of process? Yeah, I mean, I, it's pretty pretty likely that something in the environment would uh, have to pick up and make this um, easier. And we can think of a few ideas about how that might be. But we don't want to prejudge how people are actually trying it out. We want to keep going and seeing. So I'm afraid anyone who plays Wolfpack uh, in the next six months is going to go through a bit more of that pain. Um, so it's not just about living together collectively, but about creating code together co uh, collectively. Um, uh, the process really doesn't uh, expect the pack to be working on the same code at, at the same time, all the time, but a lot of the time they're, they're intended to be, they're certainly always focusing on the same problem, um, and a lot of time they really are working very close together. Um, so, uh, you know, as I mentioned, one phase involves them working on, on spikes where they're going off on, the own, on their own, but then um, eventually they're going to choose one of those spikes and the others all get thrown away. Um, so communication really seems to be critical in this process. Um, and we've noticed that the packs in general, um, and I should say we had a problem with this here because the room was quite noisy, but the packs in general and the other um, venues where we've done this maintain this sort of constant chatter. Um, they were, as they were working, it was a, you know, a bit like when you're, when you're driving and pairing, right? What you're talking about, what you're doing. Oh, I'm looking at this method. Oh, I just found this. Does anybody know how to do X? Does anybody know how to do Y? Um, 
and that sort of background of this information, not all of which is even relevant to you right now, but just sort of hearing it around you seemed to be very important for this group to orient themselves and really work together. Um, so whatever the solution, I mean, right now we've really, we're really seeing it as a working in the same room kind of a process, but if it was going to work in a virtualized distributed environment, that communication channel I think is really key, and it's really about you know, broadcast sharing of, of information widely. Um, and the analogy to us really seems to be that it's like a team sport. Um, other analogies that we came up with is you know working on a trading floor or that kind of thing, but it's a you know it's really a team environment and you're you're supporting each other. And we see um, we saw one example where um, within ten minutes, so these are groups of people who often don't know small talk, and within ten minutes somebody said. Uh, we, I know how to do this with a single cell on the Sudoku board. I've got it working with a single cell, but I don't know how to do it for the whole board. And instantly someone said, oh, I know how to do that. And they j just took over the code and kept writing. And so it's that kind of, you know, almost tag team, um, which the, the packs that have really got into that seem to have a lot of fun with it. Um, and this is one of the things I think it can really fundamentally change the way you're working. Um, that's it. You're up. Did we want to say something about road bumps? at this point, I can't remember. But uh, wh one of the uh, sort of observations about programming, I'm probably wandering off the script here. Um, wh one of the uh, things that we sort of observed is that if you're programming on your own or maybe in a pair, you quite often hit road bumps, things that you don't understand, things that uh, bugs you haven't been told about, this kind of thing. If you're working in a larger body of uh, programmers that are collaborating, you will still hit those kind of road bumps, but you're much more likely to move over them much more quickly. And that might have some profound effect on the level of productivity and the quality of what gets produced. But we're not quite sure. Yes, I'm sure, I'm sure we talk about that later. Um, okay, shifting sands. Uh, there is a problem with this environment, which is that um, the code is continually shifting underneath you. And... Um, you know, I've heard n n numerous um, rather frustrated wolves going, someone just changed my method. You know, I'm not very happy about this. What do I do? Well, it's not your method. It's the PAX method. And if someone else has decided to change it, that's okay. But the problem is that uh, as a result, you don't know exactly what state your code is in because someone could be changing your code before you've really tested it. In fact, they could be changing your tests um, before you've run them. So you then have a problem that your test suite, which you don't really know whether it's in a stable condition or not, um, uh, could be run against a bunch of code that someone else has changed underneath you. And that gives you a kind of problem because you really are standing on shifting stands. And uh, you know it's unrealistic to expect anyone in the pack to follow what the whole of the rest of the pack is doing and therefore to know the state of the code, even just the bit of code they happen to be working on at that moment. And so a number of strategies have to be come up with to, he to help people get around that. And uh, we think that these are uh, probably um, a couple of these strategies that we, we would need to implement. Okay, next one. Uh, the first one is continuous testing. Um, this would be the automated running of tests the whole time. And to do that in a cost-efficient way, each test has really got to know what, it's run, what methods or classes it's run against. It's got to have an awareness of its scope because when something within its scope changes, it needs to be rerun. It needs to rerun itself. And then you need a bit of behavior, a bit like a... Uh, you know, a garbage collector going along running tests in the background just as you go, just for good measure. Because it may be that uh, this uh, particular uh, test has, you know, has not up to this point affected a particular method, but because of the way that you change something, um, it, it now needs to run, it will now run over a particular method. And, but the trouble is that poor test doesn't know about that yet. So you need to make sure that all tests get run anyway uh, on a regular basis. And so in the background of your uh, shared image, these tests need to be kept running and you need to see effectively uh, the thing going green or red as you're coding, okay? Um, and you then from that, you also, when you suddenly find that this test 
that you thought was working perfectly has gone red, you need a bit of information to help you work out um, who's broken the test or who's changed the test. So we came up with two strategies um, to deal with that. The uh, first one is called heat. And this is a representation of where someone has been. It's not saying who that someone is, but it just tells you that the code uh, has been touched, has been walked over um, in uh, a recent time. One minute, five minutes, an hour, two days. And so the heat would fade from the method as, you, uh, as it was g grew older in terms of being touched. So it gives you a quick visualization to see where um, other pe people have been wandering. And the second one is sent. And sent is uh, so that you can identify exactly who has been there. Okay? Um, it's a bit like a wolf marking the territory. Um, you can tell exactly who went and broke your code. And then you can have a uh, nice conversation with them about what they thought they were doing. Um, and so you really need, you need that awareness in your space. And again, it's a, it's a bit like it's about the virtual reality. It's giving you a better visibility within that virtual reality space. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, and not only do you need that in the, in the user interface, you need that in the tests. Because when a test fails, you want to know whose code broke that test, not just whose code broke, or who broke the code you're working in. Um, so... We've talked a little bit about code ownership, but to, to draw the metaphor to a wolf's territory, wolves don't own territory. Wolves, wolf packs control territory, um, but individual wolves don't have anything. So we sort of visualize the same thing, where um, if you imagine a world with, with multiple packs working in a, in, a, um, in a company on a project, you may be sort of fighting for control of, of an area of code or a certain set of functionality by by being the one who's fixing bugs, you know, by, by being in that tori and territory and hunting there, that's your control. But the pack doesn't own it, and the individuals certainly don't own it. There's no concept at all of individual ownership within the pack. It's entirely a team process. Okay, so that led us to a, um, a few thoughts on where we might go next. Um, as we said, this is very much an experiment. Um, and we are feeling our own way in terms of where we should go. So we had a number of questions that we, th we thought we would share with you about uh, issues, maybe. Uh, the first one is the role of the alphas. W we've uh, noticed that alphas come in several different shapes and sizes. Remember, the alphas are the um, dominant wolves. They are the ones that do the directing. They kind of guide the process. And they come in three shapes and sizes, we think. Uh, the first one are the type that delegate. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to do that. No, don't do that. Uh, the next one is what might be termed a first amongst equals. So that is someone that uh, kind of facilitates, that uh, directs, that is influenced by the others, um, and uh, uh, lets the others kind of get, get on with it in their own way, largely, and then reins them in when necessary. And the, f the final one is... Um, the role of, of just being another equal, really, not uh, being at all dominant and uh, just trying to get on with the process um, as best they can. And I think that we have questions about why this is. Uh, we've come to realize that what we're doing is we're asking eight complete strangers to uh, sit around a table to work on the same bit of code using a process they've never used before, um, a language they've probably not used come across before, um, and certainly strangers that they don't know very well. And uh, that is very unlike a, uh, a real team uh, that would be working day in, day out using this process. So uh, they get about two minutes to pick their alphas, and uh, that is also pretty challenging. So, um, you know, people get pushed into that role, maybe, but they didn't want to do it, or... Um, you know, maybe they just don't know each other very well, and they, you know, all those kind of problems. And we think that that is probably partly um, to c causing this. Um, and we're also not sure which is the right role, uh, the way, the right way that uh, alpha should behave in our metaphor. So we're just going to keep watching this and see how it goes. Okay, then um, the most obvious issue 
as uh, one wolf partly told me, uh, he said, you, you're going to have problems selling this in, uh, in big companies because uh, we have enough problems convincing uh, senior uh, managers to do pair programming. You know, that's two people burning, uh, burning uh, hours uh, on one problem. And here you've got eight people burning uh, on one problem. You know, that's very expensive. And if you think about the Wolfpack on Monday, uh, each Wolfpack managed to burn three person days worth of resource in that experiment. And so you better be pretty sure that you're getting value for money. And uh, there are some clear areas where it looks like there are inefficiencies. Uh, there is some additional cost because you have everybody working on top of each other and on the same thing. And that needs more coordination and you know, seems quite expensive. Um, you also have this point where you have people working on different spikes. And then you only pick one of those spikes to go forward. So the other three, five spikes get thrown away. And that's also quite expensive. Um, but then there's a trade-off there because you are hopefully picking the best design solution uh, for your particular solution. And so we think that there is a trade-off in code quality versus the extra resource. Uh, again, we have no firm metrics about that and we have no real... Uh, clear idea one way or the other whether that trade-off is working. Um, there's another point where you've got just two wolves coding on the problem and every, all the other wolves are sat down chatting, drinking coffee um, or whatever. And that is also probably an area of maybe some concern to a senior manager looking at his team uh, not necessarily producing. But uh, on the other hand, quite a lot of time in a programmer's life is spent thinking. It's uh, spent trying to understand and consider uh, the problem and come up with good designs and uh, a consensus about how things should be approached. And I think that maybe this process is just uh, forcing that behavior in a particular part of the process. Um, so it might be that and it might not be that expensive. Um, and, you know, I think for us, we've got to try and work out how we get better, a better idea and measure these different trade-offs that we're seeing and, and really come up with some stronger answers to answer the eight people on one problem issue. Okay? Um, you, know, if you, you can think of uh, situations where solving a critical problem, uh, the, the business cost of that problem is so significant that having eight programmers working on it is it's worth it. But then, you know, the answer to that would be, well, maybe eight separate guys working on it would also solve your problem uh, just as quickly. So you've got to show that this thing is faster at solving specific problems to be able to use that argument uh, for or against it. Okay, next one. Um, we did notice that, uh, you know, we dealt with a lot of people who had no small talk experience. And we were really uh, quite brutal to them. We, we gave them uh, nine slides and ten minutes to master the language. We've been, in the last six months, to a fair, f fair number of conferences where they've had uh, lectures where people have kindly stood up and tried to explain Haskell to us or Scala or whatever. And they stand there for three hours and they go, okay, you download this tool chain. It's really good. Download from here, 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 here. And then you, um, you run this, and you run this, and then you've got a REPL. And you code something in there, and you keep going. And our experience coming out of those is, um, well, that kind of looked interesting, but uh, we don't really have a clue how to actually program anything in it. Um, you know, it's very kind of rote if we manage to keep up with whoever was doing it. It's, it seems to be a very difficult style to learn something new. Uh, yet here we had a... Uh, a majority of people who really don't have any idea about small talk at all, and um, yet, you know, we had people uh, saying, I, "I can't believe it! I've, I've, you know, I've never seen small talk before in my life, and here I am contributing to the solution." And that is, there is something about the pack and about the shared learning experience um, that seems to be more effective than learning through traditional methods uh, or learning in a kind of uh, rote 
solitary way. And uh, I think we want to look at that a bit more. Um, we're also a little suspicious about uh, the role of small talk in that. You know, it might just be that small talk is cool uh, rather than um, wolf pack is cool. And uh, that's also something we've got to think about. Okay, so on to our um, final but favorite uh, subject, dispersal. Um, okay, so what happens in uh, wolf pack families is that uh, if an argument happens, uh, it's, it's a natural process that as uh, the junior wolves grow older and more senior, they become a little bit more uh, argumentative and eventually they break off from the pack. They disperse. And an individual wolf will leave a pack and go and try and form their own pack. Now, this is quite a dangerous activity and a lot of wolves die in the process because you lose the protection of your pack and you have to go and find another wolf uh, you know, of the opposite sex to form a new family and um, go and set your own wolf pack up and find a new territory to uh, go and hunt in. But we think this metaphor might work for dealing with conflict within the wolf pack. Uh, in a programming environment, we could see uh, the idea of, uh, uh, you know, some programmer saying, God, these alpha wolves are running this, this programming pack, they're terrible. I just, I've, I've had enough, I'm, I'm leaving. And rather than leaving the company, they just say, okay, I'm leaving your programming team. I'm now going to try and set myself up on my own with one other person. And that is the challenge of it. You've got to convince someone else to go in with you and to form a new pack. And then you've got to find a bit of the code base to take control of and to hunt and to do solutions for. And again, that fits quite nicely with the idea that wolf packs never own code. They only own it by walking the territory. And so you can have sort of self-forming teams. Uh, and again, uh, this seems slightly wacky, but um, we think it might be an interesting area to explore as well. That's, that's the company I want to work at. <laughs> yeah, uh, the death rate seems to be quite high too, though, in that company. But, you know, well, there are. Okay, so that's, that's our thoughts and uh, experiences from Wolfpack. I, I have to say that... Um, most of the wolves that seem to have taken part in these things have generally enjoyed it. Uh, at least they are kind enough to say that to our faces. Um, but, uh, and we certainly enjoyed doing it, but it's, um, it's very much a work in progress. Okay, any questions? Um, two, two questions come to my mind. First is, uh, what kind of problems do you see fitting this methodology best and which is just not adequate? The second one is, um, are you, how, how sure are you that, I don't know, in this committee process of finding a solution and just following one approach, uh, just selecting one spike, is a good one? I, is it always the best solution coming up? Um, taking your second question first, one thing we actually didn't mention, which I think maybe t touches on that, is the um, that the wolves, the real wolves and our wolves, may switch between those two modes. Um, so well, any of those modes, really, if you uh, if you are chasing, so they're chasing an animal, they think it's it's the right one, and then they all pile in on that animal, but it turns out the animal is actually faster than they thought. The wolves don't necessarily invest a lot of time in that. If they if they realize going in, okay, this is maybe we chose the wrong one, they'll go back and um, you know find another weaker animal. Um, and so we expect that the that's partly why we talked about the fluidity of changing between modes in this environment is that you can very easily swap the whole team and go, okay, no, we're going back to selecting, we're going back to doing spikes. So I think that sort of touches on your second one. Okay, I'll tell the story. Um, we, we have a very nice story about the disobedient wolf. Um, okay, so we, we had one wolf pack where um, the, the alpha wolves were directing the various wolves to go and do things. And after the spikes, there, there'd been a bit of an argument about which was the right spike to go for. And uh, the alphas in the end decided that the, you know, they would pick spike A. But uh, the guys who'd written spike C you know, were convinced C was still the best. So they kind of contributed to A, but in the background, they were also still trying to get C working. And so you got this uh, situation where the pack as a whole got A, solution A working, and then about mm, 30, 45 seconds later, the <laughs> these disobedient wolves said, yeah, we've done it, we've got C working, you know? 
And uh, so it, it gave us some thoughts about uh, the role of disobedience within the pack and the fact that uh, maybe disobedience is kind of uh, allowable within limits and that uh, uh, the alpha, you know, is kind of quite absolute but not completely. And th that may be, may be worth some more development. What, yeah, what was the first question? Sorry. We have no idea. Sudoku, pu Sudoku puzzles. Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, actually, maybe, maybe nothing. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Is the answer? Um, uh, I don't see any particular reason for saying it's good or bad at anything. You know, I, I, I think we'd need to try more. And, and to be honest, I don't think until we actually got some company that was foolish enough to give us a chance to try it for real, we would have really much concrete stuff there. Okay, next question. It looks to me like this sort of a process whatever benefits it provide will provide over the long term, right? You end up with you know, competing packs and, and uh, you know, if there's productivity gains, they're not going to be visible over, over a day. They're going to be visible over months because, yes, you spent you know, eight guys where one would do, but you came up with a much better solution that will save you time down the road. Uh, on the other hand, your experiments are all very short term. Uh, have you thought about how you can do... I'm any other way that you can get more data about how this works over the long term. Do, do you know a nice, friendly company that will let us play? I, I mean, seriously, we, we, we recognize those problems, and you're absolutely right. The closest we've come to so far is, is and we haven't done it yet, but an intention to bring some of the groups that have done experiments with us already back to do further experiments, um, which is obviously still not quite the same, but at least they're familiar with the process. and. If we could get it so that we actually had, you know, a team of eight that was willing to commit to doing it a couple of times, at least the team would sort of gel as well. Um, so that probably is the next sort of stage we'll look at, I think. We also thought of doing it in a company, in a project team that already exists and has relationships, and so they don't have to go through that learning curve. One, one other thought. Um, it seems like this is a really intense process. Have you, you know... Is this the kind of thing you imagine people doing day in, day out, eight hours a day for Well, the wolves manage months? it. I mean, you know, they, they, they do it. They walk, they walk their territory about 20 miles a day, and uh, they hunt every day. So um, there are rest, rest periods. You know, there is a particular stage where uh, only two wolves are, are hunting. And hunting all this time, right? <laughs> they hunt every day, but not all day every Absolutely day. right, absolutely right. And uh, that may be, you know... We don't expect our programmers to work more than eight hours a day, maybe, but I don't know. Yeah, it's a fair point. It's an absolutely fair point. Well, speaking in a metaphor, uh, a wolf can catch a mouse by itself, and uh, smaller animals definitely, but uh, the, the benefits of the pack is really to tackle uh, an animal that is a bit large for one wolf to take on. And um, uh, thinking back of two days ago, you really gave us a problem that I think any of the eight wolves could have tackled by himself. Maybe took a day, but definitely could have tackled by himself. Shouldn't you think about uh, maybe try to organize a spike on improving Monticello, for instance? Uh, okay, that's a very, very good question, actually. We are... We, we've had two different uh, tests or, or um, challenges for our walls in the various times we've done it. And we are quite angst-ridden about whether we've got the right thing. And I think a result of this week is that we probably, what we're doing isn't quite right either. But at least with this group, yes. Uh, it has to be said that, you know, when you've got a, a pack full of people that have never seen small talk before, you kind of have to expect less. Um, but when we first did it, we said, I can't remember, it was something to do with the, uh, to do a test runner. Yes, build yourself a test runner um, in, uh, to test the uh, ANSI standard collection class hierarchy, something like that. Something pretty open, you know, uh, reasonably big, chunky problem. And um, within the time limits we had, which was about three and a half hours, um, it was just too open uh, for the kinds of wolves that we had and uh, our level of experience with the process. So I think that 
it, you're absolutely right that the pack is about tackling big problems faster and things that individuals just won't do very well at. Um, I'm not sure we've got a good way of thinking, but we will go away and think about that. It's a good point. You've uh, got the standing process, two wolves on it, the alphas watching. You've got the running process, everyone is working. You've got this issue of how do you keep people from tramping over each other. Could it be argued that precisely standing is when the problem is sufficiently complex that if the eight all charge at it, they will trample on each other, and that the running process should be we are clear enough about this process that people will not trample on each other because they've actually sussed that this getting a handle of it is sufficiently clear that it is following your nose and the guy writing the tests and the guy changing the methods won't trample on each other because they're actually trying to do the same thing and that therefore we are trampling on each other is a sign for the alphas to say the problem is standing switch to standing two people do it the rest watch able to run means so I, I just offer that suggestion okay yeah I no, I don't agree. I think you're wrong, Julian. Um, no, I, uh, okay. My, my inclination is to say that, um, you know, a wolf pack, uh, the whole pack moves on an animal because they think they can solve it, right? They can kill it. And you will get four or five wolves pulling down a bison, right? And they will all be on it at the same time. And uh, I think that that is the right way to think about it and that uh, standing is not... Uh, just a sort of backing off because everyone's trampled on each other. I think that what we've really got to do is is come up with better uh, habits in the uh, the running when everyone is on top of everything to allow people to effectively code in that space. And I'm not sure you know we've got the answers to that, but I I don't think that it's a it's a back off. I rather like the standing. I kind of think those are both valid. I think the um, I mean I think you're right that the if you are trampling on each other, it is a sign that, that you can't all be run, running at once, and it is a sign that you back off, which is not to say that the tools don't reduce the number of times that you have to do that. Um, but I think it's seem, it sounds to me like a fair enough observation that um, that, that, might be a, that might be a cue to the wolf. Yeah, hi. The other day I participated in the activity in the workshop, and I, I want to give some feedback about that. I think that it was a, a very good idea to work on a, a solving a Sudoku instead of solving maybe Monticello, the other proposal, because I think that to work on, on real things, you have to have certain understanding of the domain or on the tool, and Sudoku, is, I think, is, in, is something that everybody more or less is familiar. So it's a good point to work on, on something like that, I think. Uh, that but really was our main goal, and that was to find a domain that we thought most people would know. Uh, at the same time, I think that we have an issue, unless in, in the group I was working on, that we are crazy geeks and we lost the focus of the exercise because I think the, the focus was to exercise the process. And we all get excited about the technical solution, trying to find a, a, a crazy algorithm to solve the Sudoku, uh, and, and we lost the focus. Um, maybe I think that it could be interesting try to do the exercise iteratively. So in that way, maybe if we work in iterations about 20 minutes or half an hour, we can get the focus again at the end of each iteration. Just a proposal. I think one of the things that we realized is that we, we kind of bounded the process by time um, in the way that we described it to our wolf packs, and maybe that was misleading. You know, if you if you get through a spike incredibly quickly and you only take five minutes and not half an hour, then that seems to be fine. So um, we put time in there because we were trying to guide people. But I, I take your point that if we, you know, kind of iterated smaller chunks, basically, um, that that might well be effective. I think the other thing we're we're starting to get to is that as we start to see more and more iterations of this and start to understand better what works, we can move a little bit more from, you know, you guys do, ha you do, do your interpretation so we can observe and, you know, we're able to start guiding the process more, but there's a, you know, there's a, a tension between affecting the results that way to, as well and we're sort of interested in, you know, just because a group didn't, didn't solve the problem doesn't mean it was a failure as an experiment because something came out of that. Um, so there's kind of a, you know, I don't know if we're quite at that point yet, but, but certainly 
we will get to a point where we can say, well, okay, we can be standing over the group and say, okay, you should stop now. Let's, you know, talk about what's happening, that kind of thing. Um, maybe just more comment than question. A couple of things. The, you looking for a friendly company to try it out. Um, I think y that's going to be hard. Um, but uh, th the traditional way of solving this problem is to find a friendly university um, which has a lot of students learning uh, software engineering and uh, maybe learning small talk as well. And I think it would be great because you could also then have control environments. You could, you know, have a traditional team, a pair pro programming team, wolf pack teams, and actually compare and see how the results come out. Yep, that's a good idea. Thank you. Um, yeah, and then just a comment as well. You know, way back in the oh, late 70s, early 80s, um, we were marketing a methodology for doing system development. And one of our clients at the time was uh, Siemens, obviously very German, very precise company. And um, we had a very visual um, modeling approach with, um, you know, domain models, process models, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the execs asked us, well, what do we need to do to use your methodology properly? And we said, tongue-in-cheek as a joke, uh, a r you need a room with wall-to-wall -wall whiteboards. Um, and they took us seriously, and they went away, and they built one. Um, and it was actually fantastic. It was about 10 meters by 10 meters uh, room, and about as high as this room. And it literally had wall-to-wall -wall whiteboards on every surface, uh, <laughs> some pin boards and some whiteboards. And it was the most fantastic project room because when you walked in there, you were immersed completely in the, in the problem. You had the diagrams on the wall, the solutions on the wall, the sketches that people had drawn, you know, the proposed user interface over there. And I think if we could create something like that in the virtual world, um, where when you get into the working, you've got available to you, you know, the domain model, the UI prototype sketch that somebody did, on a whiteboard somewhere, the code, you know, your repository change with your heat tracking. Uh, so if that information is all available to you in the virtual environment, I think you could even do this on a distributed basis, and that would be phenomenal. Yeah. Just quickly respond on the, the distributed basis. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, it's perfectly possible to run uh, web velocity, the technology we were using, in a distributed mode, but we've run this with the walls literally sitting around the same table. And that physical face-to-face -face thing seems to be a very important aspect of how it's done. However, um, I, one could imagine, if we get the process to work a bit better, uh, that you could think about how you might stretch it in a distributed model. And we would have to play with that a lot more to try and get it work. Because there's a, there's a whole lot of additional issues you have to stack up onto the problem to get this kind of thing to work. Okay, so for those of, of you who uh, do not have uh, their t-shirt yet, uh, the, the new ones arrived, so please go to the registration desk and take your shirt. Thank you very much. <laughs>